No. Forward. Forward, backward, pointer. Okay. okay. So yeah, um, June 1st, uh, 12 a.m. midnight, probably first time ever um, coming out of the back door of the state capitol with uh, 10,000 pounds of narcotics on the back of my trailer. Is it? <laughs> so um, with that, we got it home. We started, uh, we had the ground prepped, ready. Uh, we went with a 30 pound seeding rate. Uh, about a half inch deep in the soil. Soil temperatures were nice and warm. As you can see, we were looking for approximately 10 to 12 plants per foot squared with um, looking for maybe six to eight live plants per acre, taking in the mortality rates through your germinations. A lot of different things uh, are involved in your mortality rates. Obviously, now this is a dioecious plant, meaning you have a male plant and a female plant in the same field. So after the male plants pollinate the female plants, those male plants will die off, do not produce a seed. They only produce a pollen sacs for germinate or for pollinating the female plants which produce the seed. And we figure somewhere in the 30% area on the X59 as the male plant. So there again, with your uh, thousand kernel counts, uh, that's what we're looking for is about 30 pounds to the acre. And um, it was amazing, within three days, emergence of the ground. Go ahead. That looks like very sandy soil, is that correct? Extremely sandy soil. Um, those particular pictures um, on uh, irrigation at Macville, North Dakota, following potato rotation, which I would not recommend ever. <laughs> Another hard lesson learned. I quit call, it, uh, quit call it my learning curve. It's the tuition I pay to learn. So anyway, with that, um, yeah, the potatoes just left absolutely no organic matter in the ground. They raped the soil of everything and left nothing. Um, getting back to, you know, what you guys are promoting here with your cover crops and things like that, uh, hard lesson learned there for me, and that's a uh, obviously uh, something I'm definitely going to follow in the future. But with that said, now uh, the emergence was extremely fast. Um, it come up with um, so June 2nd seeding, there we are on the 29th of June. It kind of got into, it, it looked like it stopped growing, but as we, we noticed it was then setting a very deep tap rut. They just, just grew down, down, just, uh, and then it, it, the plant just exploded forward. It just, uh, here we tried some 15 inch row spacings and uh, I was really impressed how the row closures, uh, it uh, really set up nice row closure after a while. It looked like, boy, if this was, uh, you know, gonna be, Obviously something to consider on the organic side, uh, hemp is ideal for weed control on the organic because of its real quick closure of the rows and chokes out uh, any weed. You wouldn't do 15 in organic. What's that? You wouldn't do 15 No, you would not probably, would not want to do 15 in organic if you knew you had a weed situation. But uh, there again, I was pretty impressed how that quickly did close in the rows. So shortly after the 5th of July, then we went in with a foliar application of the Pro-Grow from uh, Profit Pro here, and it was just amazing how that, uh, that plant took off from those nutrients that the, it sucked up. All that uh, green foliage there, that plant was just, just ate it up. Um, the growth rate was three to four inches a day after it really established. It was just amazing. How many acre field are we looking at here? Uh, on these irrigation pivots uh, right there in the irrigation, they average from 125 to 132 on an irrigation pivot, depending on the, you know, the right-of-ways of the roads and whatnot. So, but yeah, yeah. These are, these are male plants here setting their pollen, pollen buds. Now, after they've opened, they're actually quite pretty. And then after they have pollinated, they die off, but you can see on the picture to the left there, those are the male plants setting their pollen buds.
quite a difference from the 13th of July to the 3rd of August at uh, just amazing growth. So I'll just run through some of this and then, uh, well, like I say, what works best is, uh, you know, question and answer. But it really has a dual purpose to sunlight. Um, up to the 21st of June, it's, it's setting a lot of foliage and, and its, root, its roots and stalks and things like that. And as the days start to shorten, 21st of June, you know, the Celestis, as the days start to shorten, the plants notice that. It, it, it sets its energy towards seed development. Um, with that open bare ground, we suffered a lot of wind damage. Um, and about five days after planting, in North Dakota, the wind started blowing at 35 miles an hour for 35 straight days. The sand, I had water on it. The sun would be out. I found out I was getting too much water on it. Uh, really doesn't, its roots don't want to be wet, too wet. Uh, actually, it is a bit drought tolerant by setting that deep tap root. But I could not keep that sand wet. And the wind blew. And the sun would be out in just that just that very top minute of area of sand is like shards of glass just sliding across the ground and it just tore into those elongated coleoptiles terrible. But um, if we could just breed a little bit of uh, a stress into that plant, what we found is uh, you know, about a 48 uh, inch plant setting seed pods all the way to the, within two inches of the ground was, it was amazing. Because with, we're really not after the fiber at this time, we're after seed and until fiber comes on market, fiber really isn't your friend at harvest. <laughs> <laughs> no. <clears throat> so that opens up a whole different deal. The plant grows, you, you get it a good start, you feed it, Good sunlight, growing conditions, it does it all on its own. Now we enter harvest. Well, here we're trying to decide, you know, here. You're gonna have, okay, you look at your plant, this X59, it really holds its seed tight in there. Um, I would break a plant, you know, wondering if we're gonna shell out and I'd smack it against my leg and very few kernels, three, four, five kernels with a thousands per fell out. Now I was in Minnesota at a different growers, different seed, and I just tapped that plant and it just exploded with seed. We've heard that it's held well over the winter, harvested up in Canada. You know, they get an early snowfall, they harvested it in the spring and it held up really well. Amazing, I wouldn't want to try it, but you know, in North Dakota we've done things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are trying to decide when is the harvest date. So you're going to have 12% to 22% moisture kernels on the same plant. But looking at the bottom third and scraping out, um, getting a good look at a little bit darker color change from the, the green, um, that was a tough call at the time. But we found with a higher moisture harvest that that 18 to 22 moisture harvest on average we did not have the fiber issues in the combines. As the plant and the grain started coming down in moisture at, you know, 14, the kind of the, the stock started setting a little bit of its redding and it became very fibrous. And if you've got five guys on the crew unslugging a slugged combine with hemp fiber, there's a reason they made rope out of it. <laughs> By the end of the day, you will not be friends. You'd be lucky if you got a crew, really. But uh, you will need a good sharp knife and a uh, fixed blade knife because uh, there will be wrapping. It, uh, it will catch on anything that turns. It will hang up on the head of a 3 8 bolt in your cleaning area of your combine. Uh, nowhere, anywhere did it say that harvest was going to be easy, did it, Lon? Okay. <laughs> yes, but uh, we did find, you know, taking it a little bit on the wetter side helped the harvest issue, but it created a different issue getting it back to the yard, treating wet, going
Go ahead. Is this something that could be windrowed and use a pickup head, or is that not an option? Uh, as you look here, this is a little bit shorter. This was a wind blown. This here is where I was talking. If we could just you know put a little stress in it, keep it shorter, keep the fiber out of it, it could be possible. I mean, windrow and use a pickup head to, to harvest. Obviously, uh, on this particular, you could here, but you get into uh, 68 inch, 70 inch tall. No, no, because now fiber. You just do not. You're gonna have to leave a little, really, because we just found out when we took off the first day, I was in the combine, Ken was with me, and it was camera lights action, and away we went about 100 feet. <laughs> the machine was rumbling and grumbling, and I uh, had some 70-inch tall stuff and some 40-inch tall, and I went into it too much fiber, wrapped around the front of the elephant ears and the rotor of the combine. Ah, uh, that was two days of digging and knifing out and pulling out the front side of the combine. And uh, then I turned the combine over to the guy that runs the combine all the time and just said, don't do what I did. And everything went real smooth. <laughs> and I stayed the heck away from the combine. <laughs> so you won't be I'm probably going to stay out of there. And uh, I went back to the yard and I handled it as it came in. So. Um, there we are on that windblown piece, a little bit shorter, but uh, you know, there in mind, you can see we there's a, there was some little bit left behind, but boy, that fiber coming through that combine is uh, it can create some serious issues. So with harvest, we would we went to uh, Anoka. Well, did, did you, uh, didn't you have a, a chance to talk to some of the guys up in Canada? That uh, yes, yeah, not? yeah. Ken and I went up to uh, Qopoli, Qapel. Uh, yeah, something. Capel, Capel. Capel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when we crossed the border, and the guy asked where we were going, and uh, the way it was spelt, I had Qopoli, and Ken thought it was Qapel, and he looked at us and said, "Well, yeah, you guys just go." <laughs> <laughs> Neither one of us can speak French, so <laughs> no, you're all right. But yeah, we did. We visited with some, some farmers up there and got some ideas and um, kind of see how they do it in that area and um, got a real good look at those uh, Regina Plains and, uh, and that's worth the trip in itself. Uh, just amazing vastness of open acres, quarter section, quarter sections. Upon. Everyone knows you can't take a lot of fiber. We just tried anyway. Yeah, you know, <laughs> until you've done it and made the mistakes, you don't know for sure. So now we know for sure, and I'm telling you, just leave a lot of that fiber behind. So the trick was... The trick was... was to not get too much fiber in the machine. Right? Yeah, right. here, you know, you've got, your, you've got your taller plants here, and you've got your shorter here. Right. So you've got to turn those yield monitors off in your combines. If you've got them, don't look at it, don't use it, just... Uh, if you got 20 feet on a 35 foot header, just take that 20 feet to that 40 inch stuff, you got 10 feet on there, then, then go get that. But keep the, the height even so you're cutting at that level and not taking in any extra fiber through that machine. So that's why doing a biological seed coating and maybe some trace elements to all the plants to perform more evenly well, yeah, uh, you, yeah, there's through soil health and plant health, yeah. absolutely. To um, get an even stand. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. yep, yeah. yeah. So that all starts with soil sampling to find out where your soil health start, mm -hmm. and then a good soil health program to plant health program, absolutely, yes. But what I wasn't counting on was 35 mile an hour winds for 35 straight days. <laughs> Matter of fact, I flew my airplane into uh, Kenzie picked me up and I said, I need a haircut. I'm pulling my hair out. I had to get out of North Dakota. I just, uh, it was driving me crazy. I had to go over there. There wasn't anything I could do about the wind. So there we are at harvest. And we started pretty slow. We would take off. Now, this is towards the end of the harvest where we had the you know, semi out there. It was getting a little bit uh, drier. We're learning how to handle it better. But we used our Unver Unverfirth. Uh, uh, seed tender, and we'd take off about 15,000 pounds at a time, go into the yard, we uh, purchased a, a grain cleaner, density grain cleaner through Grain Cleaners LLC out of Anoka, Minnesota, and uh, that really, once we figured it out, very 
easy machine to use, just like everything else, takes a little learning, trial and error. And once we got that, we'd do 15,000 pounds at a time, we'd increase it, okay, we're getting this down now, so there's a little bit of, uh, you can see up there, that is the density grain cleaner as we were coming in. So going up back into the cart, there uh, is the clean grain coming out. Uh, and it works on density, of course, the heavier kernels are gonna fall down through, and it's just airflow, no gravity table, no, you know, no seed handling. And then, of course, going up into the bin, you know, so happened to be is all I had was a 90-foot, 13-inch auger for that, which kept it, just like on your harvester, low, full, and slow. Um, really did not see any seed damage. I was quite concerned. That was one of my major concerns was seed cracking damage, and uh, we just slowed everything down. It went uh, rather well. Here we are with our grain cleaner doing some separating. It's our, you know, our better seed here and the lesser quality lighter going out the other side. From Wisconsin, um, in the middle there is Lolly Baldus. Maybe you, uh, Lon, uh, Lon uh, Al Baldus is a congressman from Wisconsin for many years. Back to when, Lon? In the 80s, 70s, 70s? Yeah. Well, there's Lolly. She was, uh, she had a placebo there. She thought uh, she was feeling pretty good after that. <laughs> okay, well. Um, all right, let's see. Okay, so we get to harvest modifications to combines to your harvesting equipment. Just know that anything that turns, that fiber will catch it and wrap. It's called a hemp hangover that never goes away. It's just uh, these little fibers will get in, they'll wrap on the shafts, they'll get in the bearings, they'll take the seals out. Um, it'll wrap tight, the dust, uh, uh, static electricity, uh, have air compressors, be ready to blow your machines off, you know, keep a close eye on things. Fires will start, it's got high oil content. We had a couple of small smoldering fires. Um, like I say, anything that turns your drive axles, anything that could catch it uh, for your machines. We took the chopper out completely, dropped the chopper plate, uh, just let the chopper, didn't even use it. Um, there's no way you're going to chop it anyway, so. Uh, what else did we do? Just uh, d roll a duct tape and a good sharp knife really was <laughs> a fixed blade knife was duct tape, duct taped up, uh, just bolt heads. It'll, it, it would catch and it'll hang and it'll build and build and build and it's just uh, unreal. Uh, what else? Um, any questions, you know, let's go from there. How did they used to harvest it 100 years ago? I don't know. I wasn't around. I don't know if you ever researched it. Oh, yeah, I researched it. You know, I'm sure uh, I've got some pictures of some indigenous stones I have at home. You know, I have some Indian rocks I can show you. I'm sure they maybe used that. But um, I don't know. I don't know how they did it. But uh, maybe 40 years ago, they had walker machines and things like that. And I was concerned about my rotor machine. I was, I was very concerned about it and thought maybe I was gonna have to do the inevitable, get a dear John, but I didn't, so, and we made it work and it worked well. So these newer machines will handle it. Go ahead, look. You know, on that comment, you're actually better off with the red ones because the diameter of the rotors are bigger, being just a one rotor machine. Conventional machine works. I have a different take. Neil told you the right answers. No one, none of us knew how to harvest. You know what is right. We're all learning. I went on the tail end and thought, drier the better. That way we can condition and put it in the pan better. But I had a. I hate to throw more like a John Deere, but I had a Lexion version. As, you know, with two rotors. And still, 
look like Neil saying, you only want to cut your heads. Don't, the mentality of farmers wanting it at all, because that's all we've been programmed since day one since we farm. You get it all, you know, you don't leave nothing behind. Don't do that. But anything smaller diameter makes things prone to wrap. I thought I'd do all right with Alexion. You find out fast. The rabbit accelerator the, roll. The first, the, the first five acres seem to go fine. All of a sudden, things start acting weird, and you don't know why. All of a sudden, you start getting fires. You start getting things go wrong with you. But that's two things going on here. I was dealing in a drier environment, and that made the fires more prone. And the type of combine I was using, our predecessor in Canada told us certain machines work better. And there's a reason why he said that. It's all about diameter, circumference, or size. But I wound up renting a conventional John Deere, go back quite a few years, and I did okay. But it's harvesting of equipment. There's a difference. Why did that conventional work better? Is it the children going faster? Or what's it? There's not well, so much threshing in it? Conventional just <clears throat> gets it first fast and lets go of it. Then just let the straw walkers just shake so the So you're through that cage? Shelling it's really easy. No problem to thrash you. So just unlike anything else, corner soybeans need to keep grubbing or grinding or doing, you know, you don't, it's nothing to get the seed off the head. So it's just, uh, it just, you just touch it a little bit, but then, then just a little separation. What's the nutritional requirement to raise a crop? And then what is the second question would be, you're raising hemp, you've got the seed, how do you deal with your neighbors? What do you mean, how do you deal with the neighbor? I... Is that going to be a wheat problem for the Well, yeah, there's obviously going to be volunteer wheat into the, or a hemp into the next year, yes. And uh, um, from what I understand, the research that I've done, the farmers that I've talked to, and our neighbors to the north, is it is the first to emerge. You know, give it some time, give it all a chance to emerge. Um, light tillage will take it out. Um, if you're not in an organic uh, situation, um, a glyphosate and a phenoxy burn down with a 2,4-D and Roundup uh, easily kills it. Um, uh, and then, uh, what was the first part of the question? Nutritional. Nutritional. Well, you know, there again, we start with plant health or soil health. We take our soil samples, see what we got. Um, they, whoever they are, they say. Um, you know, like a, a, a good heavy spring wheat crop, um, you know, a spring wheat crop with high proteins, maybe you don't raise spring wheat around here, but somewhere in the vicinity, 125 pounds of N, you know, 30 to 40 pounds of P, 30 pounds of K, somewhere in that area, you know, just, uh, and then as it's growing, I don't know if you take leaf cultures, leaf tests, but uh, where we really found the jump in it was through the foliar applications through Pro, Profit Pro here and their Pro Grow. It's just, just, I've never seen anything kickstart a plant when put it into another gear like that did. It was amazing. We really thought we had a disaster from the wind. We just, it was, it was a make it or break it. Okay, Dennis, bring us something, get us something here. Let's, let's give the. Otherwise, we were done with it. I thought we was going to lose a couple of these pivots, and wow, it just uh, came to life. Amazing. Just really uh, turned it around. Yeah, it went from really nice stand to, oh my gosh, we're going to lose it, to let's take a chance, let's just try this, to here we go. That particular piece did about 890 pounds the acre. Um, 890 pounds an acre is a lot better than what I there through July thought I was going to have. Um, my best that was well protected from the wind went 2,224 pounds. So. Well, we tried a lot of different things. Um, 
We went in with a disc. Some of it, we bucked it and burned it. You know, we come behind the combine there. We, our intentions were maybe to try and bale it, but uh, we ran out of time. We were in soybean season at the same time, and um, that just didn't work for us. But um, what we did was buck some of it into piles, burnt it, and then the whole city of Macville thought they were getting a placebo there just before Thanksgiving, and they ate all their baked goods, and there was nothing left for the company, and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we had to go to town, get chips and pizza. <laughs> but uh, no, we tried a heavy roller on it and uh, rolled it flat. We used a big heavy roller for soybeans. We tried that and then went at it at a 90 degree angle of the way we laid it down with a disc with just a real light, just a real light disking just to kind of crack that stock open lay it down, crack it open, we gave it some time, then we came across it a little bit different angle with a vertical tillage like a sulfurd. Um, I've seen where the moldboard plowing on the shorter stuff like that, but when you've got the tall, tall fiber standing there, we found out we had to lay that flat. Otherwise, it would, a disc, it would wrap up in the bearings on the disc, and boy, there's just nothing worse than taking a disc out and having to bring it back home and change bearings right away. Um, it's just one of them pieces of machinery you hate to see leave the yard. But, uh, like, from a flail shredder over it? Or? You know, there again, a flail shredder, uh, I'm afraid just anything that turns, you know, it turns. <laughs> you know, where no. what that fiber is like. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a reason they made rope out of it. And that, uh, that, that one question you know, was just driving me nuts, you know. And if you, what are you guys going to do? Stand there with a handful of seed. What are you doing? Making rope out of that? Well, that's all we did the first day, really. <laughs> <on> that. <laughs> then I stopped using. Ziegler came out. It didn't take long to take the parts out to get the rotor out, but it took us a half a day to dig the rotor out. It was like a rope, shipyard rope, wrapped around it just like Yeah, it doesn't pull. It does you gotta cut it out and forgive. And you had to counter unwrap it the opposite way the rotor was. It's ugly. But I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just trying to say you have to You're you really got to sl just slow down, take your time. This isn't beans, this isn't corn. It's... We learned how that you have to deal with it. You have to have a whole different mentality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you really do. You know, um, you can't rush this. You really can't rush this. I'm really curious how the old timers did it because there was quite a hip, bit, but a hip. Have you ever talked yeah, to the, the old timers? Well, how did they do yeah, it? They were, they were doing, I mean, they, it was all for fiber. They, so, so they would sickle, they would sickle mow it, and then they would also. And they didn't care about the seed. No, no, you harvest if you're if you're doing the the type of farming that the, that they were after, or what they were doing is they were going to harvest it before it goes to seed. So also that fiber is a lot softer. Okay. Like if we're harvesting grain at you know 20 percent, that that stocks a lot, lot you know uh, softer, but. When you when you're they were after the bass fiber, so they were actually that that stock is a very uh, much more weak compared to what it is if you let it go to grain. So it's a whole different ballgame. And that's like now even if there's a market established for that for that fiber, then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to sickle mow it and then square bale it. You know, it's not going to be a it's not going to be as big of an issue. Where right now if you're trying to figure out what to do with the toughest part of the plant. But, you know, working that back into the ground organic matter, um, returning 60% of the inputs you put into it, returning it back to the soil through organic matter, um, really good soil health, uh, that ground needed organic matter put back into it. And I'm looking forward to, um, you know, going into it now this coming season. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. Uh, to that point, actually, Neil, um, you know, there's a lot of talk, like you say, that this is a really uh, soil health positive crop. It, it would certainly be interesting to see this used as a cover crop to, to use it that way if uh, if there was an option to do that. So, you know, that might be for growers who don't have the ability to actually harvest uh, just using it out there as a another type of cover crop for soil. Health. So then you would, what, would kill it off then shortly there? Yeah. Yeah. 
Because I just met with a guy who wants to reclaim uh, over in western North Dakota in the oil fields to use it for uh, uh, reclaiming the ground, putting uh, different life back into the ground on these oil spills and oil containment areas and uh, how it takes in the carbons and uh, different things like that, you know, interesting there too. So, go ahead. I had a question about the milk seed is mixed with the female seed when you plant it? Yes. And then how, how is that separated at the harvest? Or? Oh, the male plant dies off. You can see the brown plants in there. Um, after they've, they've pollinated the female plants, those male plants just, they turn brown and die. And you pinch that stalk, it's like a straw from Dairy Queen. I mean, that plant just, there's nothing left to it. For the next year, the, the, seed the, the female, female plant, The female plants produce male and female seeds. Yes. At the same ratio as you're supporting the supply in the first place? Well, we would like to think that that's bred into the genetics of that plant, yes. Uh, obviously, I don't know that for sure, but, um, you know, through its foundation, cult through its cultivars and its foundation, and it's registered to certified, I would like to think that it's somehow in that area. I don't know how you would test that, but, yeah. Yes. Can you talk about separating the seed? You know, once you get it into the uh, into your uh, tender, and then you separate it in with the, uh, the cleaner, and then you put it into the bin. Here's here, yeah. Here's where another another real issue start. Yes, is as as we get it home, um, as as you're harvesting it, you obviously. You know, these big large machines now, 300 bushel hoppers, uh, you don't want to keep going a couple, an hour or full hopper because this, anywhere from 14 to 20 moisture, it will heat and it will heat fast. And uh, what like Ken likes to tell us a little story that the guys are getting ready the next day and Ken asked them, you know, have you, you know, emptied the auger, the unloading auger, you know, they blew the combine out, but the unloading auger and, uh, said, no, no, well, you're just going to waste seed. And Ken said, no, no, empty that auger out. Overnight, emptying that auger out, there were, what, two-inch long sprouts? Yeah, just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, when we get it home, or get it to your yard, getting it to here, here's where another process, which is very, very important. Otherwise, you will lose all of your seed. And we started, we... Um, Removing foreign material the best we could, the blank seeds, the, the leaf, the foliage, uh, just all FMs, best we could, getting it to pure seed. We put it into the hoppers with uh, high volume air fans, and uh, after about two days we would come back, completely empty that bin, reload it again, because Air wants to take its point of least resistance after a while, and what we found, it hang up on the sidewall a little bit, and um, it's just so important. So we would fill the bins. People, these, these full air floor bins, they're really not drying bins, they're curing bins, you know, and they build a cure zone, and that curing zone pushes from the bottom to the top, you know, and it moves the moisture and the uh, you know, builds up barometric pressures and it moves the moisture from the bottom out through the top. And we just found out that we would fill that bin, give it a couple of days, let the curing zone. I, I had moisture cables in my bins and I could see the zones where it is. And then we just rail the semis, empty the bins, reload the bin again. And uh, we just started unloading the bins yesterday through the winter, um, cleaning for seed, and everything stored um, surprisingly really well. was not an issue at all. But um, what moisture are you storing it at? Well, we started at 22 moisture, and we want to bring it down to 10, 8, 8 ideally for long-term <coughs> storage, but uh, 10 and under for sure. So yeah, it was, that was a must. That was a must to get foreign material out of there, the blank seeds, and get it to as close to pure seed as possible. You can't believe how much FM is in it. It's not like corn or soybeans or harvesting the eight or oats. There, you will have a lot of leafy material. That whole head that he showed you, there's so much fines in that of the leafy material, your sieves, your normal sieves can't get that out. And it will bridge in your combine, coffers, and everything else. You don't go and fill till you're 
pop or smolder, you will have a headache. Yeah, and even a truck sitting at the end of the field. Learning curve, but you got to remember, you're dealing with a whole different dollar animal per acre, and your whole mindset of what you think you harvest in a day gets thrown out the window of what you think of what a normal day of harvesting is. Brian? Uh, how many acres can you manage in a day? <laughs> well, like I say, you know, we started with, uh, we had taken off 15, 20,000 pounds at a time figuring it out. Uh, we do that maybe twice a day. And then trial and error, we're picking it up a little bit. Uh, I would say towards the end there, uh, where, where we're coming, you know, we're like anything else doing corn, where, where, where does it funnel back into and backlog out at the dryer? Well, it backed up, you know, with the cleaning process. And um, so I did not want any truck sitting full overnight. and. Uh, after several days and through a lot of harvest already, those 24-hour days are wearing tough on a guy. So I suppose, you know, you could really push it if you're, you know, I think I can do a little more this year, but, you know, 30, 40, 40 acres there, maybe 50 at the end. Um, started moving along pretty good, but we started low and we started slow and learned as we went. It's not a hurry up, hurry up thing. No, this is this is not corn. This isn't beans. It's a different animal. Neil said it right. Um, what you harvest, you have to clean right away. And right. that's what's your bottleneck is as much as anything is there. Yeah, you don't want your truck sitting at the end of the field for three, four hours because it will heat. Post harvest planning is the most important. It truly is. If you you know without that, you're going to lose your seed. Everything you've done up to then is you know to no avail. You really, that post-harvest seed, taking care of that seed is so, so important to store it. And large volumes of air, ideally, you have to. Do not put heat to it. Uh, some have tried low, low temperature heat's fine, but we cannot exceed 150 degrees. Uh, kills the vitality and everything in that seed. And, um, but uh, just, just natural air drying, large volumes, rotate that bin after a couple of days, empty it out, fill it back up again. There's where the hopper bottom bins work so good, you know. I always thought bins were always built upside down, but well, they put the cone on the bottom where it belongs. <laughs> Go ahead. So in the case of uh, China filling the markets here, we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. uh, to Korea, what's their system of harvesting? <clears throat> more clever than we are, or is this work hard? They got a lot more people doing it. I've seen pictures, they got spread out on the driveway, drying it, <laughs> sweeping it up into piles, and, you know, more people doing it, right, Ken? Well, there's a lot more acres and a lot more farms. I mean, hemp is, um, and, and for them, it's also the, the price point because they don't have as much to travel. You know, Korea's a little closer to China, so they, their price points can be, um, you know, much better. But it's the fact that they've been doing, they never stopped doing hemp production in, in China, ever. It's been, it's been cultivated there for over 2,000 years. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of acreage. And, you know, they have some older machinery, but they're still not that far behind, really. But. What's the approximate harvest date? Approximate harvest date, well, I'd like to say you know, 100 day growing season, but that's, you know, that, that's just kind of a, it all depends on what happens after 21st of June and the day starts shortening. Uh, but it was mid September, mid end of September. You know, kind of right about the same time we started soybeans, so with a second to June seeding date. Right? So, what is the trigger point, do you think, that makes the decision that you're going to harvest? Your seed head. Yeah, I'm uh, kind of looking at the bottom side of the seed, the one of the seeds that are going to develop first, and the change in the color, a little bit darker, and I was worried about shelling, which never really was an issue at all with this X-59 compared to some others we saw in Minnesota, it was terrible. Um, uh, yeah, it just, it just, it was time to go. And it looked like I was ready to go, and we just went with it, and it was, you know, mid late September, and, yeah. Neil, you had commented 
at the meeting something about tiger stripes on the sea. Tiger stripes on the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see this. Wasn't three quarters of. Yep. You're about 10 to 12 days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yep. yep. so in Minnesota, I have their, their research report right here, and they said that the, um, the harvest date in Minnesota varied from, uh, let me see here, three growers. I'm sorry, I spoke a little too soon, but it said from early September to uh, the average harvest date was September 24th. And that was at uh, that was at uh, 112 days days after planting, but they went from um, range from September 30th to November 8th. Our, the dates of harvest for the other two, so nine out of 33 growers were not able to harvest their crop for a variety of reasons. The dates of harvest for the other 24 growers range from September 30th to November 8th. But I think that's got to be, it's got to be uh, August 30th because it says then the average harvest date was September 24th. So from August 30th to November 8th is the window that everyone harvested in Minnesota. And I know the particular November 8th guy. <laughs> Do it because he left that patch there because it was kind of gradually full there. And so he elected to leave that area that was November 8th when he harvested. Sounds as if you're speaking in the third person. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually some of the other things. Did they harvest it with a chainsaw? <laughs> I know. So what is what is that deal with the antique cost per acre then? Thirty pounds. Thirty pounds at four dollars, one hundred twenty dollars an acre. Okay. Where is the market? Ken, is the market domestic here, or is it foreign? Where, where is the range production? For us, it's all domestic. We're not doing any exporting as of right now. Is it mainly in the Midwest here, or just kind of all over? As far as who we're selling to? Yeah. Yeah, it's all over. I mean, there's a couple big in California companies, um, and they've been so. Our main, our main goal in, in stage one is to transfer transfer the American companies that were selling American consumers Canadian grain. Our big push was to get them to start buying from American consume, our American producers, and that's what that's where we're at right now. And now we're moving into expanding n into new markets. But that was our first push was taking the larger American companies that were selling Canadian grain and transitioning them into American. Yep. And now there's Wisconsin's coming on board. We've picked up quite a few of the the food producers from Wisconsin uh, that were buying elsewhere, and then some new Wisconsin food producers that are adding hemp into their product lineups, which is, that's pretty exciting for us. Give, give us some examples of people that might blend 
in, in human food? Uh, what, what kind of... Well, a lot of it is, uh, you know, your different uh, sports bars, um, granola bars, sports bars, but then um, now they're starting to use the, the protein powders in, in just protein, like your protein shakes. Um, but uh, some of the companies are looking at using the, anyone that can use um, oil in their products for, for the protein aspect of it, uh, that, that's, a, that's a biggie too. But most of these are, I mean, and then also we've got a few uh, beer, beer makers, um, local, local brewers that want to use, use hemp grain in their, um, in their brews. Yep. I noticed the other day, I checked with Walgreens here in town, and uh, I think three quarter pound is like $17 as a meal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Which brand was that? I, I can't remember. Okay. Andrew again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there again, I paid my tuition to learn, so I'm going to go with it. You know. Actually, it's the acting majors. Yeah, I really am. The organic majors. Yes, so, um, yeah. yes uh, you know, I enjoyed growing it. I really did. Yeah. Uh, very easy to grow. Really, really, once it gets out of the ground, I mean, yeah. you don't have blowing sand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, and there again, you know, I just for some reason I thought I, so, under irrigation, I could control drought. I could control uh, too much moisture on the sand. Uh, you know, I could foliar feed with new fertigation. Uh, I thought I had everything covered except for 35 mile an hour winds for 35 straight days. And then darn sand dries up. So oh, right, 100 feet behind the irrigator. Uh, summoned me out and it would just blow, just blow. And then hemp does not like wet feet, so high, well drained grounds, six and a half, seven and a half pH soils, uh, ideally. Uh, we, as you can see in the background of this picture here, we grow a lot of canola in the area. Um, <coughs> it grows canola well, it grows hemp well, although they do share some common diseases like sclerotinia, black leg, different things, so, um, you know, things to be aware of, other things to be aware of in your area here are your chemical rotations, your crop rotations. Um, ideally, it involves a legume really well, a soybean, uh, any legumes, or is a lot of dry peas and um, lentils, things like that up in our area, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, wheat, you really don't want to follow a cereal grain because of the density and the size of the kernels intermixing. Although you get a good stand, you're going to harvest above it. But with hemp being non gluten, obviously we don't want a wheat in there, kernel, and it's very hard to clean out the wheat or launch your barley or things like that. And least, but you know, last but not least, the, you know, follow corn, but you've got to be careful of your chemical rotations and chemical restrictions and your chemical carryovers. You know, some of them go up to 18 months and, you know, work with your county extension agents and your uh, agronomists. I would add to that about what he's saying about watch herbicide carryover. If you don't know, because there is a history to know what is and what isn't for him, look at those labels that you used last year. Especially your crees are the, the big culprits, yeah. but see what the most sensitive crops for that month's rotation and just assume that it's going to be something on the longer side because I have seen sensitivity. We can't put a handle and say it wasn't this or wasn't that or whatever, but you do have to pay attention to your creek herbicides that are soil applied for carryover because it is very sensitive to some of those things. I'll just name some kind of random guesses, maybe like Kickster or uh, uh, different new products that are out there that have sensitivities of crops. But you get an idea of what I mean. Yeah, Brian, what, what, what? Uh, I was just going to see. Uh, Neil, what's, what are a couple of things that you've learned that you would do differently this year? <laughs> well, obviously, um, definitely 
I'm going in on that sand, on the irrigation, and I've cut down my irrigation for him a little bit, but uh, I'm going to have cover crop for sure. Definitely cover crop, uh, hold the soils down, and uh, you know, that's going to hold back wheat growth and different things there. Um, most of it was through then the timing, of course, obviously, on the foliar application. I think we hit it pretty close. Uh, second application maybe could have been a little bit earlier. First application maybe even a little earlier. I think that, you know, when, when that plant kind of stalls out, to put that root down yeah. and, and then hit it right in that area yeah. and just let it explode. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Really, real early on. Right. right. Yeah. Drive that root yeah, earlier, drive that root down, and, you know, if you make two, and then let it kick and then hit it. I mean, it's going to grow so damn fast. Yes, it just grows fast. It's just really explosive. And of course, that sand doesn't hold nutrients very well. So, But uh, it was mostly we really overthought the modifications to the machines and underthought the pre storage cleaning. And, um, you probably won't take an extra two feet of stock either. Next no, year. I will not. <laughs> will not. Matter of fact, I won't take any of it. How long, what do you see uh, developing in the, in the stock market? Fiber bedding construction. How, how long do you think it's going to? Is that going to be compatible with this variety? Yes. Or is that going to be completely different? No, it'll be just because the only reason that you would not uh, use that would be if you were going into textile grade. But if you're into the non textile grade, so your non wovens, your composites, and then the herd, X59 will be more than adequate for yields for that. So we're looking at uh, stock processing. 2020. Um, so we got a couple of years to get, to get that up and running. And it's really building the markets so that it justifies the infrastructure costs. Yep. Yep. But they're expanding fast. Uh, the, as you know, the natural bedding market is, yep. is exploding. Yep. So especially since our, our push is really for the organic side, um, if we can have organic hemp bedding, that's a, that's a big market right now.